So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome you in this afternoon session. Um, it's a panel, as you can as you can see, and I won't take a long time because uh, the the panelists will introduce uh, themselves. So I'll hand over right away the mic to uh, Arian. So it's a short introduction. Thank you. Um, and I'll introduce uh, the panelists very, very briefly here today, but their bios are at the end uh, because we have a lot to get through. Um, so to my right, I have Christine, and then Baiba, Otto, and Rick. And online, we have Dixon coming in from Ghana. And I think uh, an, Difficult uh, time of night, but thanks for joining, Dixon. Really appreciate you being here to represent uh, different perspectives from the African insurance market. Um, we don't have one of our panelists. It's been very difficult bringing panelists in from other places because of visa issues, so just try and be patient with us and some of the remote connections and so on. Um, so we'll say more about each of your backgrounds in your own turn, but we'll just uh, move forward into the slides. So here's the panel. Um, it's nice to be here. Essentially, my position today is just to introduce the topic, move very quickly through a few things. There's a lot of legalese. It's not going to be super exciting going through some of the legalese, but I feel it's important. Um, my perspective is that there is some de facto policy making being done by regulators in the insurance industry, um, and then it impacts incident response services in a variety of ways. I don't know all of those ways. That's kind of why we're having the discussion today. So hopefully there'll be time for questions and ways that you can um, tell us how you think policy is being influenced. But let's start with something really simple. How many people here have been part of an incident where a cyber insurance claim was made? Show of hands, anyone? Okay, so it's, it's relevant. It makes a difference to some of the people here. Anyone on the panel? Yeah, obviously. On the other side. So Rick's representing the insurance point of view, so it's rather relatively unsurprising. Um, but no one in the other nonsense so far. Okay. All right, cool. So um, we'll put a variety of these polls through, but I'm going to start off, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Rick, or maybe there's one already. Um, Baiba, can you pass yours along? And Rick, could you just set the stage a little bit about these exclusions? Like the cyber works exclusions are part of a, a longer history of exclusions. Could you just kind of why do these exclusions exist? Just help us out with that. Um, firstly, in insurance, there's only a finite amount of capital. Um, and I think it's a, it's a bit of mis misunderstanding that there's just oodles and oodles of infinite capital, infinite of, um, capital in, in insurance. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it's very much an actuarial model. So um, war exclusions in and of themselves were really first established to guard against... Um, bankrupting insurers. Um, so and back in the 1700s, uh, war was seen to be one of those things that, that would um, bankrupt insurers for exactly that reason. Um, Spanish Civil War, they, uh, people were giving sort of coverage for war-related um, exposures, but if you, if you then move to World War I, World War II, there were, um, again, certain Lloyd syndicates were providing elements of coverage in, in, effect, in, in world wars. But then um, claims ended up uh, outstripping premium. And so what insurers then worked out was that, well, hey, we, th this is just something uninsurable because actuarially we can't get our heads around it. There isn't enough capital in the market um, to, to pay for these losses. So, um, so that's what this whole notion of systemic exposures uh, were protected. And, and just moving forward to cyber, I think um, there's, it, it, it's along the same continuum. If you look at 9-11 um, and what happened there, everyone thought, wow, we didn't really know, actuarially, we didn't realise that exposures could go sideways on us um, so quickly. And so that's when you had the uh, implementation of terrorism exclusions because we didn't know, we hadn't modelled for those sort of exposures. So, um, and, and frankly, there was a flight to capital because you had um, a lot of insurance companies were then saying, do you know what, um, we have our own insurance protections, so we're only going to um, place our reinsurance with, with um, reinsurers of a certain um, security rating because uh, as insurers, we ourselves were concerned that we're not going to have protection for multiplicity of, of claims. So it's, it's really about systemic risk, and, and, and that's why war is 
um, protected against. So these exclusions kind of evolved to be part of the toolbox of solving problems. And you know, when we're talking about original war exclusions 100 years ago, they were well defined. People declared war and you knew what the attribution was and that was very understandable. But then you move to terrorism and it might be clearly defined as an act of terrorism, but it might not be as well attributed and the attribution gets a little bit tricky. And then of course in cyber, attribution is a nightmare as everyone in this room will understand and is a lot more complicated than it is in these other cases. So essentially, you know, at least from that history, what I want to paint is people are applying in the insurance world the tools that they had for many years that seem like they fit every problem, but maybe not so much this problem. So we'll get into that. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Just to motivate everyone as we go into the rest of the boring parts where we look at some of the cyber exclusions and then the fiery parts where we get the opinions of the different panelists, um, I just want to point out that this is a $1.4 billion question. So Merck's insurers um, have just been put on the hook for $1.4 billion. Now I want to be clear, there's a very subtle distinction here, that this is not a cyber insurance policy. This was a property and casualty policy and that's what the argument was about and they hadn't excluded cyber as a risk. So cyber is a relatively new line of insurance and it's still defining itself, you know, both in and of its own right, but also against previous policies. So trying to push these risks out of other kinds of policies and into an explicit cyber policy. But it's, it's an important question and uh, one that happened to be answered shortly before we came here, which is really kind of exciting. Um, but I do think it's interesting that even here, this exclusion was not necessarily clear and it had to be settled in a court. Um, which is an uh, interesting motivation. I did want to give you the raw docket, but uh, I couldn't get to it that day. Um, some incident responders somewhere were not doing their job or something. I don't know. Um, but the, the, the document is at the end of the slide, so you can use the link at a later point in time and access it. Um, it's some interesting reading if you want to read through an entire court case. Um, anyone in the room, lawyer, that would do that? No? No? Scott, you would do it. You wouldn't? Yeah? No? All right. Um, more seriously, has anyone here heard of the Lloyd's Market Association cyber exclusions? Yes. Are you all insur you're all insurers, aren't you? No? Okay, two of them aren't. All right, good. That's, that's kind of exciting. Um, so maybe this is a good point to hand over the panel. Shall I start with Dixon? Because Dixon's dialing in, it's late at night. Yeah, is that all right? Good. Dixon, have you heard of these exclusions? And now that you've read them, what do you want to say about them? Uh, thank you and uh, good evening from Ghana and um, thank you for the opportunity once again. So um, having read the, um, the documentation, one of the takeaway I had from the exclusion was for, um, the, the background to it was a bit okay, but coming from um, an incident responder's uh, point of view and having knowing the difficulties in trying to associate the attribution to a cyber attack and coming from the region where we mostly rely on some of the test cases in Europe to formulate our um, legislations and stuff. Going through the difficulties in, in what the, the, the European are facing and knowing the environment that we, we sit here where we take most of our test cases from your region, it's it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a dicey nature when it comes to us in, in implementing them, in, in the sense that one, we might not have the full blown capability to do those sophisticated forensics to do a proper attribution to let's say we know this attribution is, is tied to this person. So that is an area where I think we, this region is going to face a lot of challenge and probably the probability of getting uh, a state attack or a war in this region is as low as we could assume based on uh, historical data, uh, or probably based on we not being able to do it effectively to do the attribution well. So I, I think coming from that side, uh, there will be a lot of changes and a lot of um, technical issues in implementing those um, attribution and, and and not not letting go of we consuming most of our services on the cloud services. So having those, um, let's say having those mixture of uh, infrastructure in in this part of our zone would would be a bit of a uh, 
it, it's, it's a bit new, but people have started talking about it since this topic came about. I think we just had our um, uh, the cyber law coming into place because of the financial issues that we had um, from last year. So we've had some changes and some laws been coming up. Insurance has not been tackled yet. So I'm sure going forward with this um, cases that Europeans are facing, we would start having this discussion openly uh, within this zone. And am I right in knowing that um, you work in a SOC and you do this job, you know, in an everyday technical sense regularly? And so that's the kind of perspective you're bringing as well as the African perspective of what's going on, you know, legally speaking in Ghana and other places. Yes, that's, that's right, yes. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify for the audience, like the way the attribution should work, maybe in theory, is that um, you know, an incident happens in a particular country, let's say hypothetical incident in Ghana, um, and then if someone in the Ghanaian government attributes this to a particular state, then the exclusion might apply. So it's not necessarily um, that the exclusion, you know, the attribution might come from a, a state somewhere else in the world. It's that it applies within the country that the policy is being sold and used in. Um, so any other thoughts that you have about the market in Ghana? And you're, you're also representing a bit of a private perspective because you work for a bank, you're not an insurer. Um, so I've carefully chosen my panelists to represent very different points of view. So anything else you want to say about uh, cyber insurance policies and, and like, do you get any concern, for example, about using a cyber uh, insurance policy because these exclusions might be triggered? Um, having had, we, we've had an initial uh, proposal on putting the, the bank on cyber insurance uh, with the, uh, the rise in ransomware. So I think the senior management are driving towards the idea of getting an insurance. Um, just in case to transfer the risks um, a bit to the insurance firm. So we, we've had an initial engagement with uh, some brokers um, in the market. And having had the opportunity to join this panel, I've done a bit of extensive reading on, on this. And I realized that even the onboarding process uh, we, we are using here is not really looking at the broader um, liabilities that comes with the cyber attack. It's, it's mostly looking um, more likely like the way we do the auto insurance. The, the maturity of the cyber insurance here is not as mature as the European market. So currently we, we, we just doing it as a casual uh, new phase of insurance in the market in terms of the skill sets and then in terms of this, uh, your, uh, some of the European challenges have not materialized in, uh, in our zone. So probably it's, it's been taken on a more likely uh, note. Fantastic. Um, if we can uh, let uh, Dixon be a small screen again and bring the slides up, but stay, stay here so that you can answer other questions directed your way. Um, so, you know, obviously some of you have heard of them. I'm not going to read through all of these slides. You can all read, but I'm putting them up on the screen and the highlights are my highlights. There's there's actually four of these, and there's A and B variants, so there's eight of these that we could, in theory, go through, but I don't want to put everyone to sleep. The main thing I, I want to highlight in this particular one is, uh, you know, a rising attribution arising, or sorry, losses arising from a cyber operation, and attribution of a cyber operation to a state specifically. This may include formal or official attribution by the government of the state in which the computer system affected by the cyber operation is physically located. So. I'll do one of these at a time, and then I'll hand over to different panelists. But uh, I, I would be happy to accept any of the, the national certs uh, to step forward and say they want to speak. You want to, yeah? I just want to, let me just preface this slightly and give you a chance to, yeah. to answer it. So the thing to me that's interesting is that if you're a national cert, then you also might be attached to another organization that would be responsible for attribution. Yeah. All right, I'll let you play with that. Um, yes, let me share with you a case in Hong Kong. Um, just last year, there's an enterprise in Hong Kong. They were they received a, they uh, they received a cyber attack, and the attacker really stole their customer data. At the time, the uh, the enterprise they don't know what to do, and they don't know what to do next, and they don't know how to deal with the legal department of their customers. But luckily, 
the enterprise do by the cyber insurance. And then what they do next is to they contact the insurance company and the company provide them the support to tell them what to do next, to find some consultancy to do the investigations, how to, to deal with the legal department of their customer. So, so what I'm seeing in that instance is it, um, 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 it's very positive. The enterprise, the owner told me, luckily he did buy a uh, cyber insurance, otherwise he really don't know what to do. Yeah, and, and also the expense being, being, being suffered by the cyber attack, apart from the loss of the customer data and the probably much more uh, just as to deal with the legal department of customer data can huge, but luckily they do bought uh, some insurance at that time. Yeah. And um, so cyber insurance can be an effective partner in these situations and really help out with some of the costs and so on. But then uh, this uncertainty of, you know, will it be attributed in the future and can I make a claim? And, yes, yeah. if, um, if, if in that way. So I do believe the, maybe the enterprise is really thinking about whether, whether the cyber insurance would be really useful for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, I think the, what's unspoken here is that this is first generation. Yeah. So th this, this is an artefact of the insurance, ex the insurance industry not understanding that attribution is so difficult. And in some quarters, the, the, the industry will say it's tough. But if you go back to Sony 2011, it was an issue back then. But we didn't care about attribution because it was how Sony was affected. When, when the CEO and the CISO got in front of Congress, they, they found it very difficult. They didn't understand that it was the North Koreans then. But how, why should that impact insurance? It shouldn't because Sony was still impacted the way that it was. So what's happened now is that because of the necessary asymmetry of, of cyber operations, we don't call it war, not for these purposes, but this is just a, this is the first stroke. And, and, and this, um, it, it's not right. Um, and, and, and that's from my perspective. I know we, we have one or two prudential um, regulators here, but prudential regulators have, have for a long time now been saying, can you provide some clarity to this? But, there, but equally, w one of the, the, the best things about having this discussed in this forum um, with, with FIRST is that more than anyone else, the, the whole notion of attribution can be disabused from here. And that, mm. that's why we've got um, the, yeah. the people that we have here in the panel. And I, and I think we have some questions in the audience. Yeah. Hold them. I'm going to leave like half an hour at the end to ask questions of mm -hmm. individual panelists. Oh, no, but this is good. But I want, to, I want to make sure that we get through. Everybody gets a turn before we get into question mode. So, yeah. Um, all right. Um, in fact, why don't I hand over. Uh, we'll do this next exclusion in a moment. But I'll hand over to Christine. Yeah. And then we'll go to Baiba next. Yeah. Uh, talking about attribution, so I'm from a national cert, but we are a last resort, so we are not tied to the government. We are not for profit. So we're more like JP cert, not like NISC. So that is a uh, difference. What, what really gets me when I was reading, well, first one, I'm not a lawyer, and this is legal speak in English, so it's even more confusing than legal speak in Portuguese. So, But I, I think I saw several things wrong with this tax, and I'm very happy like, that an insurer said that, that this is not right. Like, and one of them was saying that pending attribution by the state, the insurer may rely upon an inference which is objectively reasonable as to attribution of the cyber operation. So what does that mean? That you read like a mandant report that says that some TTPs are part of APT something? And, and this is one of the points, because like nowadays we have too many APTs listed. They are probably just TTPs bunched together. And like, OK, this is something, some animal that's funny or some like whatever. And really, anyone can make attacks look like those TTPs to start hunting, hurting countries and industries. And that is what really worries me that we could have like for this soft definition and like thinking that attribution is easy. And I would question a lot of attributions to APTs to see 
really is an APT or not because a lot of them are all commodity malware. So it's malware that you can find anywhere. And of course, we have states that use commodity malware because they don't want to be tracked or they don't want to pass as a normal attack. And then you can see how hard it is to attribute. So what I think that's really complicated is if we are talking about a war exclusion, there is more political responsibility in it and you really have like uh, someone trying to make an attribution. But when it goes to cyber operations and mm -hmm. saying that, you know, needs to be, could be reasonably objective. So it's it's a very subjective te text. And I think it's it's really complicated because it's, you could really have a lot of people abusing the insurance system to, to harm countries, to harm companies, to harm competitors. And I think this is what really worries me more. Um, there's a delta between network security and, and the insurance industry's understanding of, of what that is. They're, they're concerned that net, no network security or, or poor network security means huge operational risk that's been transferred to the insurance industry rather than being taken on um, as an industry. But that's what scares them. And but. But actually, is it, so it's got nothing to do with, with war or anything else because, for example, there's not enough understanding when, when you look, so Anthem, when, when that, um, that breach occurred, if, if you like, it was the second largest um, healthcare institution in the US. And in, in and of itself, that, that was huge. But what happened when, when it came into the insurance industry, um, the, we won't mention names, but the, the lead insurer said, just pay. We don't want to do any attribution, we don't want to do any forensics, nothing, just pay. And, and here's me on the program thinking, no, no, but I want to know, I, I want, because if, if I'm not going to learn from the incident response, then how do I know what's not going to happen next time? Mm -hmm. But what I didn't understand is the relationship between the Marriott breaches, and there were three of them, and Anthem, and there was a state actor involved. There's no difference between mm. what happened then and, and some of this because it was all state-sponsored. But that didn't really end up being a 25 to $155 billion claim. Exactly, exactly. Um, but the, the issue was that there was not enough information and not enough understanding of what was operational risk mm. and, and what's next. But All right, let me introduce the, the next exclusion. I know this is riveting stuff, right? But um, this particular variant of the exclusion is largely the same as the last, but now says um, instead of not paying the claim at all, there might be a limit. So if this attack is attributed, then we might pay out less money or, I don't know, theoretically maybe more money. But the point is different insurers get to use different clauses and they can insert them into their policies. But these are relatively standard wordings that have been agreed, on, agreed upon. So there's a, a slight variation of the one we saw before and maybe this is a good opportunity. Actually, just before we hand over to Baiba, can I ask Christine, are, are you in the attribution game? So you're, you're a state cert? No. But you're a not-for-profit and you're no. not in the attribution game? No. Okay, cool. Interesting, right? And then maybe Baiba, are you guys in the attribution game? Yes, thanks. Uh, well, a lot has been said already, and uh, well, I'm from uh, Latvian national and government team. Uh, we have some say in the attribution game, uh, probably less than, than many other uh, government instances, but still, uh, at least we certainly know how hard it is, and we already heard this problem, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a diff difficult uh, topic from all sides, because essentially, uh, Everyone can fake uh, to be a state-sponsored uh, malware. One of my colleagues was uh, doing that on purpose with Turla. He just changed little bits uh, and, and all the TTP stayed the same and wrote a paper about that that was presented a few years ago. So that's, that's one part of this. And, and you already mentioned that this is the way how uh, harm can be done to uh, companies or countries that are insured, but then you make sure that they are actually not getting the premium paid. On the other hand, uh, there is almost never 100% attribution. So what to do with those uh, instances when we think, well, it's 50-50, maybe it's more like 30% we are sure that this comes from, well, 
I have one big neighbor that always <laughs> problems come from, so I'm, I'm mostly thinking about Russia. Uh, yeah, it would be fair, I would say, that if this is taken into account, then a certain percentage of the premium is still paid, because it's not, not for sure if, if it really is the case. Uh, and, and, that, and that's an interesting point. I'll chime in very briefly. Yeah? Like, in theory, it's going to be fairly binary. Like, the in, It's on the insurer to prove the attribution with somebody else's report at some point. Otherwise, they pay the whole thing. But that's not necessarily the same in all legal jurisdictions in the world. In some legal jurisdictions, they might pay part or award part uh, partial. So back to you. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, there is this other side, uh, because if I understand correctly these exclusions, then it can be the state who says, yes, this is attributed to Russia or China or whatever. <laughs> But then it can be also insurer who uh, hires somebody who is smart enough uh, not. or not <laughs> and says, well, it's Russia. It's obvious. <laughs> so and then if I challenge uh, insurer, we go to court. Um, this can be a very lengthy process, first of all, that's that for sure. But second, I think this is uh, very, um, let's say, hard to really make a judgment on upon if you if there is a such court case. I don't think we've seen something like that yet. Mm. We haven't. Not really, no. Yeah, so okay. there are all these pieces uh, that I think raise a lot of questions. Uh, I don't know the answers, but I like the discussion that we are having, so. Well, I think the, the biggest problem is you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Russia, geopolitics. So put, putting aside what might have happened with Anthem, the Chinese, um, or the North Koreans, or even the Iranians, um, you look at what's happening in, in Russia now, and so the, the issue from the insurance industry, again, it's a lack of, a, a lack of sight, perhaps, because they, it, I say they, I, I'm not necessarily of, in, of the same mind, that because of what's going on in the Ukraine, that there is a now a proliferation of cyber attacks, not just against Ukraine, but they're, what they're doing is conflating what happened with not Petya, oh, that can happen again. And now there's a war that we can, we can add to that. So, so the problem is going to be far worse. We'll call that cyber war. And, and it's not because it's cyber war, it's just that there's a lack of, a lack of sight. Mm. And to be a little fair to the insurers here, you know, they want to be a, an effective you know, participant to share some of the risk, but they don't want these extreme risks that you know, would bankrupt them. And wars do cross trillions, and there is some concern that systemic cyber could be a very expensive you know, particular case. Um, I'm going to go through these other two exclusions very, very quickly. Again, I'm not going to read them out. This variation basically introduces the idea of an impacted state. So trying to avoid ensuring critical infrastructure, essentially. So when, when the state is severely impacted, that might be so extreme of a cost that the insurer doesn't really want to deal with it. Um, I'll throw um, one more. This one explores the differences of geographic location of the computer and the impacted state. So the, the computer might be in another country, but a state that was impacted and so on. So you know, I leave you to read these things and discuss them with lawyers and so on. Then there are the B variants, in case you have trouble sleeping at night, you want to read these. Um, and these cover different methods and means for making attributions, which is fine. But I don't want to spend all the time on this. Now I want to you know, maybe bring uh, Dixon back up onto the screen um, so that he can comment and take questions from the audience and really open this up um, for people to say whatever they want. We've introduced the topic. Um, hopefully you're interested. So um, questions? You had a question? Yeah? Um, can we give him a microphone, or shall I do it? I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. So, um, uh, so my background is technical, so I'll probably miss a lot of legalese and stuff like that. Um, but one of the things that that really grabs my attention is the whole attribution that you're talking about, because um, one of the things I'm, that I'm wondering is. is why do insurers focus on attribution and not on sophistication? Because if I look at my home insurance, um, my insurer just look at, do you have the right lock for protecting that door with the valuables that you have? But they're not asking me, okay, did the local gang break into your house or did the national gang break into your house or did the sophisticated gang from another country break into your house? So why is the, in, in the cyber world this distinction which doesn't seem to make sense, at least in my head? <laughs> Mate, it doesn't make sense to me either. Um, the, part of the problem is that the, the, uh, they're looking for protagonists. 
So they so right now cyber insurance is this nebula or oh, sorry cyber as a as a threat or an exposure is nebulous. Um, and so what hasn't really happened is that there's a, a, a taxonomy or a, or even a, even a nomenclature around um, what you would call TTP that doesn't exist in 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 cyber insurance. So they think it's a, a blob, and they're concerned that if they don't. Um, th so the the easiest target is okay. Who are the bad guys? But but 20 years ago, bad guys were hacktivists. Um, Anonymous, for example, whereas that 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 came and went, but you've still got state-sponsored um, attacks. But what they haven't done, for example, is to say, okay, well, what, what ransomware? You could argue that that's state-sponsored, but the the level of the level of understanding of uh, TTP or, or even the threat actors generally is not in insurance. What it is in this forum, um, and that's why it's great that these guys are here because th this hasn't happened in insurance. Those those war exclusions that you see, that, that that's just representative of one, of, of Lloyds of London, one committee. That, that, so we have the Bank of England here. There was, there was none of that, um, uh, we didn't talk to people like Dixon, for example, so whatever the case might be in, in Africa, no one asked. That's just what Lloyds of London and one committee came up with to say, okay, well, we think this is the best capital protection protection that we can think of right now. If I might add, I think his question goes a little bit with what you said before, like that what the insurance world should be looking for is how mature are the organizations and how to lower the risk. And, and I think this is something that be, needs to be better discussed because, for example, I'll just share an anecdote of an organization in Brazil that we know of. They were very mature. So they were going to hire a new insurance. And the insurance company said, oh, I need to evaluate how mature they are on security. And they hired a company that says, I'm specialized in evaluating maturity of security. And basically what the company did was to scan their network IP address and see which ports were open or not. And that organization is very mature, works in critical infrastructure, and has several honeypots because they want to know what the bad guys are doing. And the guys, I don't care, you have an open port, your insurance will be more expensive. So this is just dumb. So I think we need to open more this discussion between insurers and between who is doing instant handling and instant response and instant management, vulnerability management and the response way, and not just have those checklists of what tools they have. They don't, have that. They don't know if they have processes that make the tools work together, if they have training. So it is complex. I think this first is a forum where we could discuss what actually is the minimum of cyber hygiene, the minimum of uh, practices that you have. And if you have an industry that says that I know how to evaluate maturity, but know how. So, and that is a, a company that is international and that's very well known and that says that does, and, and that's what actually they were doing to evaluate the maturity of, of the security. So I think there is, the way it should be like this. So if an organization is more mature, of course, you're going to have less risk. And I totally agree that we cannot get to a point that the premiums are so expensive that the whole insurance collapses because we need insurance. So I think that everyone wants the insurers to be healthy and to be able to help. But we, we, we need to talk more, I think, openly about how to get there. We, we are not there yet, but we have like these anecdotes of, you know, like this I know it's not a good idea or that is a bad idea and then maybe we can find something better. And I, and I want to give you more time to explore that. I just wanted to point out it's, it's similar, um, insurers are similar to certs in many ways, right? Like we could say it in this room and say this is the right way to be a cert and this is how you should do it. But every country is going to do it differently because they do everything differently and insurers are the same. Some of them might choose to scan those honeypots and say, sorry, you can't have your, uh, you know, policy. Others might choose to be more intelligent and approach it differently. Um, I'm going to let Olivier ask a question. I still want lots more questions from the audience. Um, just identify yourself and speak the question clearly. And then if you want to talk to a specific person, address them. Thank you. Olivier Kerev from France. 
Uh, it was written previously that um, regarding uh, the attribution, it may include formal or official attribution by the governments of the state in which a computer system affected blah, blah, blah. In my country, we never do official attribution. Never, ever. Sometimes the head of the uh, national agency will speak about uh, an animal, but that the most he will ever say. So what do you do in such a case? Because there will never be any official attribution. I guess in theory that means claims will always be paid in France? Oh, but isn't this the, the moment when an uh, when insurer can hire a consultant who is a certain degree of uh, probability says, yes, it's this animal. <laughs> At least in theory, these attributions should be done by a state and not just a private entity. But I don't know. We, we'd have to see how that plays out in time. So, uh, again, this is one of the best fora available to make those some of those decisions if attribution actually counted. But actually, what, it, what I think is more important is that there's more knowledge. But we were talking about this last night. Part of the problem with, with insurers is they don't want this to be politicised. So I know from, pre, from um, my own experience that some of those companies in critical national infrastructure in Brazil, Australia, the, certainly the US, they have information that they will share with you freely as an insurer. But also, I've, I've, we've tried to, we've gone to some government agencies around the world. They also will share information with you. But the trouble is, that's, the insurance industry thinks that that's being politicised and that looks like lobbying. So therefore, we can't talk to the government. Whereas what's happening now is some of those insurance companies who don't want to make progress are now saying, we can't fix this, let the government fix it which is lazy because there is so much capital out there wanting to fix this um, and good capital mm. with the right people. So this doesn't have to be a, a government issue, but, um, but the government is willing to help in other areas. And I know people, uh, sorry, institutions in, in, in this community are also wanting to help. Mm. Dixon, uh, I'm just aware that you're up very late. You've, you've done a great job of staying here. Um, if you want to say anything, or if anyone wants to ask Dixon a question, let's prioritize him, and then, and then if you uh, want to go to bed, I can understand. Thank you. Thank you for staying up so late. Is there anything you want to say and raise your hand? You want to ask Dixon a question specifically? Yeah. Okay. I'll pass the mic, and then Dixon can respond and have any closing remarks of his own. So I'm curious, like in an ideal world, what should the role of the insurer be? Because you've got the part of, of the policy, the exclusions, the contract, all that type of stuff. And then an incident happens. And then the insurer is involved, an incident response company is involved, and a client is involved. Who gets to make the call about how much time you spend investigating? How much time do you spend on restoring? Should you even restore? What are you going to pay for? So in an ideal world, what's the right role of an insurer for the entire process? Okay, so... Um, Sorry for the complicated no, no, question. That's a great question. Um, yeah, and let me put you on pause because I said questions for Dixon, Dixon specifically. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dixon, do you want to speak, uh, say anything you want? We're at half time here, and you're welcome to stay on the call the whole time, but I'm aware it's really, really late there. So if you want to make any closing remarks or if you want to stay, it's up to you. But, Dixon, what do you have to say? And then I'll let Rick chime in later. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a very broad question. So if, if I say let's shift away from the side by, uh, when it comes to the auto claim, who makes the decision on how much premium to pay on the car damage? I, I think using the same concept, this will have to be predetermined on the onboarding stage than when an incident happens. But then there would be a bit of back and forth on I think this should be addressed on the onboarding stage that based on the amount of service or exposure that you have, this is the premium you're going to pay. So once those determinations are made on the onboarding stage, I think makes the uh, the conversation when the actual incident materialized to be more effectively managed at that stage. And some of the policies do make it clear. Like, for example, they're now 
ransomware exclusion policies that say your total policy might be one million, but we will only pay 250,000 for ransomware uh, claims. So some insurers will make some of that explicit to you, uh, others may not, um, but I think your point is taken. Yeah. Will you stick around and join us for the whole thing, or is it, uh, is it too late? We're keeping you up. Yeah, I, th I think I have to sign off. And, okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And um, I Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's any, any other questions for Dixon, and maybe a round of applause before he goes so he can hear it? Thank you so much, Dixon. I hope to see you in Thank Japan you. or at one of the regional conferences. Yes, of course. Thank you. Sure, sure. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Now, Rick, if you want to say some more. Or actually, before we go to Rick, do you think, show of hands in the room, first should advocate on cyber insurance policy in any way or not? Yeah. Yes? Is that, is that, there's one hand up in the back. Most people don't think so. There's a second one? Okay. The third one, okay. So some people do, yeah? Well, what do you mean with advocate? What would you like to see? Here, I'll pass you the microphone. Okay, well, uh, should uh, first comment to Lloyd's on these exclusions in some way? Should first say, hey, we're incident responders and this stuff affects our work? For example, what he was addressing just now, like what should be the role of a cyber insurer in how far can you investigate, who is deciding what, I think it would be important if first could state something about that, for example. Part of the problem is that it's the evolution of cyber insurance. So this cyber insurance, as we're talking now, has only really been... Um, it's evolved since probably 1998, 1999. It was bricks and mortar, it was e-commerce. Then it was data breach and privacy. But it's, of course, so much more than that now. So what's happened is that the incident response piece hasn't evolved with everything else. So what we're stuck with, and I say stuck with, some insurers are stuck with, is the notion that everything needs to go through a, a, um, a lawyer this is not a, a legal issue. This should go straight to incident response. But what the legal fraternity have said is that, well, attribution counts because uh, what, what about client um, confidentiality? So if you go straight to the incident responder, you lose that. And who's the incident responder working on behalf of, the client or the insurer? I personally think that's rubbish. So I, I think that if, if a client has a breach, it, it needs to go to, to your community first, and um, and the the, the the lawyers should get pushed back. So, so an attribution then doesn't really become an issue because actually the incident response community is saying, okay, we understand what we're looking at, we understand how this has happened, and we can also help the insurance industry understand how systemic this issue may or may not be. Um, because you guys, more than anyone else, understand that some of these issues aren't necessarily systemic. Okay, maybe in your part of the world it's a little more systemic than others, but technology doesn't work. You understand how technology works. Sadly, in the insurance industry, not a lot of people do. So they think, oh, if there's an attack, wow, this can go sideways through the, the whole global economy. It doesn't happen like that. Um, if, if there's going to be a global cloud outage, well, that's going to affect everyone, but they, they don't even understand regionalization. So. Um, I think if first were to put up their hand to say, okay, we, we can start leading this narrative because as a community we know more about this than, than anyone, that should happen. But at the moment it's being held hostage by, sadly, lawyers. So we have another, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but here you go. Yeah, so I, I guess it's a, a few, so apologies. Um, so I'm Keir from the National Cyber Security Centre in the UK. Um, for us at the moment, Insurance and interest in insurance is a huge topic because we're beginning to see, I mean, the Lloyd's piece in and of itself kind of has, has made us pay a lot more attention than we would have done previously, especially when there's discussion around not insuring in cyber at all and seeing some of the underwriters consider withdrawing from cyber insurance, etc. There's a couple of things that I'd be really interested in your opinions on as a panel. Um, so for a bit of background on the attribution piece, we've 
just done our kind of first ever set of cyber sanctions. And a lot of that focuses on obviously setting out prescribed organizations that you can't pay in the event of a ransomware incident, or should I say individuals. But interestingly, we have put the onus on the victim organization to do the due diligence to make sure that they are not in contravention of those sanctions. We will never attribute their incident. So it's a, it's a weird situation where they could choose not to do the due diligence and be okay. So that's kind of a weird thing to kind of park to one side. But when you, um, in terms of kind of where first might advocate, what I think is really interesting about this space compared to kind of kinetic events or theft and things is in war more generally, the government is the either the insurer of last resort or has sort of sovereign responsibility for protection. Whereas for years, the weird thing about cyberspace is that all of the, the priority for defense sits with the organization. It is not with government. So like, we don't protect everyone's networks, that's on you. So you're responsible for your protections. And that seems like a slightly odd mismatch and I think something that probably needs to be sort of sorted out before we get to the kind of natural maturity point of some of the insurance policy work. But I'm kind of interested for your sort of perspectives on how it differs from the sort of the traditional landscape you would expect. Is there someone specific you want to anyone, anyone who wants to catch it, I guess. Thank you. This is not my panel. Um. Go on, Otto, Baiba, you haven't said enough. Yeah. Uh, Don't let him speak too much, I know Baiba, him. But we were discussing about like the first role. What I think is, I, I, I don't like the word advocate that much because it looks like we are lobbying or something. But Fair. one of the things that is a problem is that most of the executives in the companies that are having to take decisions, they are basically taking decisions based on vendors and not based on real data and best practice. So what is one of the challenges is that like you have the vendors now saying that they have the next generation SOC tool that can replace all the analysts. And then if you have like insurers buying into that and not seeing that you know you can have you need tools to free time of analysts and you need processes. And first already has like a handful of practices to help instant handling. We have the C-Search Services Framework that defines what it is. We have CVSS and EPSS. We have uh, Search CC with the CVSS backwards that I always have to think about how to say is the S SSVC. SSVC. Sorry. So we have tools there that really are the tools that what companies need to have are processes to prioritize what to do and they will all be different depending on sector. So we cannot have like a blanket saying this is the minimum security. We can have like tools for those organizations to try to tailor their security to what's important for them. And I think we are discussing this in all SIGs here. So I think that's very important that these communities talk and that they look at each other that you know about risks and insurance, but really cyber risk is something very new. And it's much more nuanced than talking about like you know other risks. And I think first has a, a a place because we are here for more than 30 years as a community. A lot of people in this panel for more than 20 years at first. So we we have seen this grow, and we know the pitfalls. And but the thing really is that usually marketing runs whatever the, the, the executives are doing, and and that noise is not really helping. So I think. This could be a forum for us to talk in, in a place and, and try to find like what would be some of the best tools or if there is something else needed. But I think we are doing a lot and still have a lot to go. But uh, I'll rein this question back and then pass back to Baiba. Instead of this question, I don't have a slide for this, but let's just say, um, do you think cyber insurance impacts incident response? Yeah, so th so there are some there are some interplays between let's say first and cyber insurance, even if some of the details are still unclear. Okay, cool. Bye bye. Well, maybe to elaborate a little bit on this, uh, I think it really depends where 
what kind of team we come from and what is our constituency, etc. And from my perspective, I would say that uh, so far we haven't uh, had impact by cyber insurance on our work. But obviously, if uh, more companies or institutions would get the insurance, it would be a very heavy burden on my shoulders. Uh, if I know that, okay, well, it's Turla, but I cannot say that it's Turla because then they don't get the money. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's one thing, well, but, uh, to put it very simple, let's say. yeah. That was a previous that, that question. Was, uh, so, that yeah. was that one, yes. Uh, then uh, I think uh, it was also already touched that uh, there are many countries that don't uh, do open attributions or, or do them very, very rarely. And we are actually trying to push... Uh, more towards doing it because of very good reasons and the well, situation that we are in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, at the moment, I'm not aware of any company or, or uh, organization th that because of that would risk of losing uh, the, the payment. But uh, again, if as a government we are warned that this could be the case, then I think it's an uh, argument that hasn't been taken into account at all. And then finally, what you said about the first role, I think it's very, uh, very important really to have this forum and to discuss it because, well, f I haven't heard about these uh, exclusions before Aaron invited me to this panel. <laughs> probably, probably, <laughs> or perhaps the same for um, some other people here. Uh, I don't think that uh, many incident responders are aware at all. Uh, so what, what would be the first goal is really to make awareness and also to participate in the discussion. And I know that it sounds easier than it could actually be because there are no really, I don't know, forum of incident responders uh, where, where insurers often come and vice versa. Uh, so th this is something to figure out how to, how to tackle and uh, where to discuss it. And one, one more thing which I had at the back of my mind is that uh, if the company is in a very good standing, if they have these honeypots, if they really do most of best practices that are, they are possibly uh, able to do, then they actually want to be insured against state-sponsored attacks. That's probably the, the thing they fear most. And then if they really want to pay insurance, then they want to be insured. So this is really against those intentions. But those, those companies that... Um, so you, uh, I'll get back to the question because this is this relates to the question. Cyber insurance. Some of the reasons why some of these claims have been excluded was because they were property insurance policies, and that's an important distinction to make. Those companies that want to buy discrete cyber insurance expect that this coverage would be given to them, yep. and and so that's when you. There's a, a natural then demarcation between the, the different types of cyber insurance coverage that we're giving. Um, it's if you're an energy company, so your critical national infrastructure, you you will want coverage for those sort of things because essentially the people, sorry, the the threat actors they're guarding against are the people that you guys are looking for in terms of threat actors. But if you're a small company. You don't really worry about that. You're buying cyber insurance, but cyber war doesn't matter. Um, which goes back to your question. Um, the so um, your predecessors with Cyber Ten Essentials that was hijacked by the insurance industry because they were trying to commercialise it. But the problem, and this is where I think this um, these guys here um, need to be, or as first need to be included in that discussion because I was sitting on on the um, as part of that whole process and I'm sitting here thinking where are the cyber security people that can actually run this narrative correctly because some of your colleagues were saying well what about incentivization well if, if we can if, if you have better security then cheaper premium great but you came out with a great little 10 point plan but it, it needed to be evangelized by different people not so much the insurance industry so it got hijacked and it went nowhere so we, we need to understand what better network security looks like and and it can't be driven by the vendors this is why i find this forum fantastically agnostic of vendors because who was it someone else said out there today one of the the, the beauties of this forum is that there's no bullshit. Um, 
but you go out there and you talk honeypots and um, a vendor will say, oh, I've got a honeypot, but it sits outside a firewall and you think, yeah, but I'm not really interested in what, what activity you're collecting outside a firewall, but not enough people understand the difference between what might be inside and outside a firewall and, and what traffic that looks like. Um, we we'll actually add a little bit. Um, again, I do agree first. It's a very good platform. If not, turn to this panel. I don't know. In the in, in UK, there's a, just a, a exclusion. So this platform, look, let us around the world know what is happening in some areas for us to be aware of. And also talking about the risk. I understand that there now there's a many, many civil days attack. No matter how much uh, an enterprise doing, there can be many holes, many holes, and together with the supply chain as well. So, um, so risk is everywhere. So I do believe for us, uh, travel to Montreal, we also need to buy the travel insurance. Insurance is helps to reduce the risk. Similar for the cyber insurance as well for the enterprise. No matter they are the big one, even those. And, and I know in Basu in Hong Kong, we have many SME. The, the company is small. They don't have much resources. Um, the best they can do, yes, uh, and do the patching. Um, um, but for those civil day friendly attack, it's hard for them to bear into. So probably cyber union is one of the method for them trying to reduce the risk. Yeah. And it's worth pointing out that Lloyd's is one market. There are many insurance markets. There are Asian-specific insurance markets. You know, Hong Kong is big in insurance. Like, Japan is big in insurance. Singapore is big in insurance. New York, they may choose to do this a little bit differently. But one of the stories generally being sold to governments, and I'm about to wind up a friend of mine because I know this is uh, his bugbear, is usually that this will help incentivize uh, great security practices in smaller companies and so on. Um, Sasha, do you want to have some thoughts about that? Um, okay, so I have a, a comment and then a question. I've never been convinced that attribution is as big of a deal as people claim for two reasons. One, the bigger the event, the much more likely everyone is going to race to attribute it, right? Not pet your wanna cry, not that big, not really a catastrophic event. And there was huge efforts. It didn't take that long to attribute it. It's not just about the technical malware. It's about the motive and the opportunity and whatever. And it was attributed and it was fine. It's not a big deal. The second is that there's a comment that or, uh, the notion in the exclusions, as, as Lloyd's uh, wrote, it has to be attributed to a state. And so maybe the requirement is that you just have to attribute to a state, not a particular state. You would not need to call out Russia specifically, but just that, hey, this was a state actor. Right? So that may diffuse a lot of the political issues around should we, shouldn't we, whatever. Okay. Um, it's technical. It's some of it is... Proliferation. They're worried about aggregation. Shh. All right. Yeah, it, it's, it's more about... It's less about politicization. It's, it's more about the technical feasibility. So believe it or not, in insurance, they're worried by, okay, the Chinese or the Russians... They're better than the French, so we have to worry about the Chinese and the Russians. It's right, just technical but, ability rather than... But my political. claim is that you don't need to attribute it to the Chinese or to China, to Russia, to whatever, right. just a state actor, and that's sufficient for all of these exclusions to apply or not apply, right? I think that, that helps. The, que uh, the actual question is, um, so in the U.S. with terrorism after 9-11, there were concerns that company... So the terrorism insurance industry fell apart, right? It suddenly no longer existed. And the concern was, oh, that's a problem because companies may not want to invest in, um, in property investments because of the lack of insurance. So there was a social problem. Somebody identified that there, there could be a problem. Mm -hmm. The company's uh, economic um, sustainability and um, uh, resilience and profitability and all of that, and so the government stepped in created this Terrorism Reinsurance Act. So one wonders, does that exist with cyber now? So given these exclusions, the question is, do you think or do you have any reason to believe that economic activity would not be happening or is not happening because these exclusions exist? And therefore, does that warrant government intervention in one way or another? 
do you know my you know my answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think put more simply, you mentioned not Petra, but let's let's say there's not Petra plus there's one Cry because they happen in fairly close succession. To your point, not a lot of economic damage, okay? But you look at the economic damage every year from hurricanes. Every single year, and pretty much every year, that's how that um, that beats anything that not Petra. So, to, so to answer your question, no. So th that's why this isn't necessarily an, e an economic problem. I think this is a problem of just a lack of knowledge. And you know, going to that point about is there economic activity that's not occurring because of these ex exclusions? Probably not, because the exclusions are still just being rolled out into policies. So these are now going into policies, and then if there was such an effect, it would happen in a couple of years' time, just to you know get that out there, right? And there's still time to comment on these exclusions or. If you are buying an insurance policy, you could say, I'm willing to accept that exclusion, but not that one, or I only want the B variant, or whatever, or find an insurer who doesn't use them. Because Lloyd's is recommending this to its members, but that's not global, right? So there's still a lot of opportunity for this to play out and change, and I think that's why I'm trying to advocate this room, getting more interested in these topics. As a member of the program committee, when you want to put a cyber insurance talk there, people are like, I don't know, it doesn't sound like fun, and I get that. That's fine. But like, if you don't want to see any more of these talks, that's OK. But they'll happen in the insurance world anyway without you. Uh, so the other issue that gets raised a lot is, um, are insurance companies able to incentivize risk mitigation practices? And if you talk to the carriers, I have, um, they will say, yes, absolutely. Our capabilities, our underwriting practices, um, it is proven that, that that we are able to incentivize these security controls to make companies safer. And my response is always, okay, well, show me. I'll, I'll, give, you know, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but show me the proof of how these capabilities, how, how you are able to identify that these security controls, not those security controls, are able to reduce the risk. And no one's been able to produce that. Marsh, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, produced a report the first ever empirical report I've ever seen from a broker about the marginal effect of different security controls. They ranked them the 10 most effective, let's say. I was very optimistic about that report until I learned that it's not really a regression that they ran, it was sort of correlations. Oh, okay, fine. Um, so as far as I can tell, it's still an outstanding questions about which security controls work best. That might be the best opportunity for first for um, uh, other emergency response teams internationally to contribute is to try and understand what security controls are most correlated with an incident, best able to uh, mitigate or reduce, prevent an incident. Because the industry does not have that information, right? We as a community do not have that knowledge. And any opportunity to drive that would be wonderful. So, because as I, I triggered on the knowledge point and on the community not having not having that capability or knowledge and things like that, um, I think we do, but it's fragmented and we're driven by money. Because we don't share that data, we don't share that information. Companies have that data, but you have to pay to get it, and then you only get a, a thin slice of this control works under this circumstance in this context. Um, and what really triggered me based on the UK question and, and the other comment about um, insurers should be focusing on, on, on lowering that risk is, um, in a certain way, you have a proxy for real attackers by looking at the mature frameworks for red teaming. So if you look at the CBEST program in the UK, if you look at the TIBA programs in the EU, uh, those are actually um, attackers that you control, where you give them goals, you know the sophistication level, you know how they by bypass certain security co controls and things like that. So if you were to combine that data across all those commercial companies that keep it fragmented uh, and consolidate that, and then add the knowledge from um, the companies in the first community on top of that, you would actually be able to, for a first time in many, many years, um, as insurance companies, or preferably, my, my personal opinion, a national search, provide a singular data set about potential correlations, potential root causes, potential consequences, what works and what doesn't work. So like you said before, this is like a no bullshit form and it, and it 
amazes me that it takes so much effort to consolidate all that information. I agree. I want to I make one subtle point about what you just said and what Sasha just said as well, and that assumes that there's some objective controls that work in all countries and all situations. It might be that security controls that work in Brazil don't work in America and vice versa. And so we have to be a little careful about assuming that there would be a data set that would provide the answer, right? Cyber risk is not distributed evenly across the globe. As much as we would like to believe it is, it's different. But, but we, we understand that anyway, because we know that, it's, it's, I mean, we write other things other than cyber. So we know that if you're writing bank fraud in Korea, that looks very different to what it does in, in Brazil, for example. Um, so there are different threat actors. We know it looks different everywhere else. Um, what Dixon has to worry about in, in Africa is not something I need to worry about in the US. And, and I would just add that another complication is not only that controls are too simplistic, they are part of the process. But you need a process and you need prioritization. And I think especially like most of these companies, they are like putting a lot of money to get compliant with something that not necessarily brings security. And that is another complication because we know that most data breaches, they were certified, they were compliant, they were like whatever, and they still had problems because they are putting money in the wrong places because someone made a list saying that this is what really is secure. So I go for what I said in the beginning that really it's more towards maturity of processes and organization and them having processes to define what's a priority using whatever we have there, be it syscontrols, be it EPSS, being vulnerability management, having a CSERT, having a SOC, and every sector and every organization will be different. So I think it's, it's really complicated to have like, I wanna have a database of controls that will solve the problems. And like banking fraud is, is exactly like, Brazil is different from anywhere else in the world. What really solves the problem in other countries, it's not even beginning on what's going to solve our problems there. So it's, it's really complicated, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of there is a question oh, back know, there. Sorry, yeah, can, uh, yeah I, I, um, I'm stumbling over the controls cause improved security question over and over again, right? So there was a, a 10 list and the three list, and I think the Marsh thing is 12 if I found the right one, Sasha. It says there are 12 controls. Um, suggestion over here that it might be possible if we had shared enough knowledge to figure out what works. Yes, sector differences, network design, architecture, country differences. I, I can't really honestly say I've seen any control correlated with any specific thing regularly. You know, yes, multi-factor will reduce, you know, stop these sorts of things, right? And yes, if you patch in time, you will not be Equifaxed or yep. that the EPSS data is like 15-year-old things get exploited, which is insanity. But um, I, I, and they're, they're also, I'm slowly learning, there may be uh, other ways to look at this from the insurance lens that you don't need to actually say these controls work and these don't in this situation. But I, I just personally cannot get over, we don't have the controls written down yet that actually work in whatever situation. I don't know how to say, you did a great job, we're gonna pay the insurance claim, you did not meet the bar, you're not covered. I don't think attribution matters much, but there's Definitely. some level of due diligence and practice that should apply. I struggle to figure out what that is. That's all. The, the, and um, I'm sorry, I don't want to hijack this, but, no. but, um, but that's why I'm here, because I, th this is actually evangelization. But to Sasha's point, the, what they, so if you're going to write cyber insurance for critical national infrastructure, for energy, nuclear. NERC SIP might be a great place to start. Okay, if you're writing healthcare, HIPAA might be a great place to start. NIST, we've had various people come over to London and say, hey, th this is the Bible. And I'm looking at this thinking, who's Bible? And, and like, this doesn't apply to all industry. <laughs> uh, well, wait, I, I, I can read, but I, I can't stop before I fall asleep. But, um, but there's no context. And um, so all I've done is, um, back to my comment earlier about cyber insurance being a blob, um, critical national infrastructure, whether it's energy, energy look, needs to be looked at differently to banks, needs to be looked at differently to hospitals, 
Okay, there are different threat actors and, and everything else. If you look at SME, back to the point, okay, there are less moving parts, and so MFA might be a, a, a bigger part to play in that, for example. But I really don't give, really don't care about MFA when it comes to energy companies. So it, there, there was no context in that report, and, and that's what frustrates me because it, at, that's about commercialisation. Everyone's got a story to tell, and look at me, it, it's all about the money. But you come here at this forum, it's not about the money. You guys, as a, as a, as a community, are dealing in zero risk. But what we're, we embrace risk, uh, so and it's risk and reward. And there's a bit of an arbitrage, but that, that arbitrage, and, and that's what, that's actually the delta that we have to try and close. Um, because the insurance industry accepts that there is an arbitrage and there should be residual risk, but they don't understand what that residual risk here. They, they think it's outsized to, to the money they're getting in. But to Sasha's point, too many people are trying to commercialise that without an, an obfuscate along the way. But there's no obfuscation in this community. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and sum up a little bit. We have only maybe five minutes left. Um, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I've spoken to little audiences, I've spoken to big audiences. Um, I really love that there's a few people in this room who really care about the topic. That makes me happy. It doesn't have to be a full room. I just want some of you paying attention to these issues, and I'm really excited. Um, then I also want to say thank you to all the panelists who are willing to, like, do some reading at the weekends or on their flights over to think about this different stuff. So I've been putting up their speaker backgrounds here. Um, I didn't read them all out for obvious reasons. Sheila couldn't make it um, because of the timing and you know visa issues and, and being asked right at the end to contribute. Um, but thanks to everybody else here. Maybe you can make closing remarks. And uh, we have five minutes, so make it quick, especially Rick. You've said a lot. Um, it's all right. Um, but maybe we could have a round of applause for everyone who did take the time to come and <laughs> Closing remarks. We'll go in order. Yeah, I think the only closing remarks is that we need to talk more about it. And everyone would like to have like the golden standard of security. We are struggling. And I think it's more about everyone having more people and processes than having just tools that at the end are not solving the problem over and over. This is what I think we are seeing. Well, I'm curious where this is going. Uh, so far, I'm very skepti skeptical, but uh, as you said, it's uh, still a lot to discuss and find the right way to protect both sides. So I, I hope we'll uh, find something that is more understandable also to the incident response side. Thank you. Expecting more discussion about the cyber insurance all together is very important. <laughs> um, well, for example, you know, there's a few insurers that come to the conference, but it's Rick's first first, and there's a few other insurers in the back of the room. I won't call you out and embarrass you, but we probably need a few more, a little bit of dialogue going both ways between these two communities. So thanks for coming to this session instead of the other sessions. I do really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the round of applause. Thank you for this uh, very interesting, I must admit that uh, I wasn't that very happy to have to uh, moderate your session, but I learned a lot and I didn't uh, see the, the time flying, so that was very, very good and a very good idea to, to have that topic to, to be here. So thank you. Uh, that's almost the end of the day. We still have uh, the lightning session that will be starting in something like 10 minutes and then uh, that's, uh, that's that will be over for, for today.